Welcome. I'm Steve Ross, and I am the incoming Myron and uh, Marion Kasdan Director of USC's Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. I'm also a professor of history here at USC. And on behalf of the Kasdan Institute and, U and the USC Initiative for Israeli Arts and Humanities, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 34th annual Jerome Niemer Lecture in Jewish Thought. And my predecessor, Bruce Zuckerman, has honored the directorship of the Kasdan Institute for the past nine years. And it's due to his tremendous leadership that we've been able to host such an incredibly high caliber of distinguished speakers at our various Niemer events and other Kasdan lectures. And although he's unable to be with us this evening, uh, I personally want to thank Bruce for his dedicated service as director and salute the tremendous legacy he's left us. And tonight, we are honored to welcome our distinguished uh, speakers, Eva Aluz, professor of sociology at Hebrew University, and our uh, commentator, uh, Danny Lanier Voss, an assistant professor of sociology here at USC. And Professor Eloz will speak to us tonight on the topic, At the Heart of Israel, Romantic Love as Politics by Other Means. Now, as many of you know, the Niemer Lecture is the oldest running lecture series focusing uh, on the field of Jewish studies at USC. And it's been a flagship event for us every year, featuring world-renowned scholars, authors, artists, and clergy over the past 34 years. And the USC Kazan Institute is honored to provide over this always thought-provoking event and to feature such outstanding scholars as Professor Eluz and Dr. Lanier Voss. Now, the Lemur lecture, <coughs> Lemur, <coughs> Lemur lecture has always brought together the academic and community leadership that was so important to Jerry and Harriet Niemer. And I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge some of our USC and community leaders who are with us this evening. Uh, Sam and Miriam Tarika. Uh, Sam is president and CFO of the Maurice Amato Foundation, which has very generously supported the publicity of the Kasdan Institute over the years and steadfastly supported us with their friendship as well. And the information you've received about tonight's lecture is thanks to the Amato Foundation and Sam and his brother Mark's enthusiastic support for all our Kasdan uh, public events, such as the Niemer Lecture. I also want to thank Rabbi uh, Zalman Kravitz, Director of Jews for Judaism. And I also invite you to learn more about the Kasdan Institute by visiting our website, the address of which is on the back of the programs that you have on your seats. <clears throat> and in the lobby, you'll also find a form to sign up to be on our mailing list so you always know what's happening here. I also want to note, it's you know, just a plug, if you go outside on our table there, you will see copies of our Kasdan Annual. Uh, and this is the 12th, volume 12, of our annual series. And uh, these are available for purchase. You can buy them here. You can buy them on Amazon.com. You can buy them through the USC bookstore. And this volume 12 is uh, devoted. We, our volumes now are all themed. And this one is devoted to Beyond Stereotypes, American Jews, and Sports. And the various essays here talk about how, in the decades after the Civil War, sports so slowly gained a prominent position within American culture. And this development provided Jews with the opportunity to participate in one of the few American cultures not closed off to them. And Jewish athleticism actually challenged anti-Semitic depictions of Jews' supposedly inferior uh, physical uh, abilities while also helping to construct a modern American Jewish identity. You all, many of you may have known the joke, what's the shortest book ever written, Jewish sports heroes? Well, this volume suggests that's not quite accurate. And indeed, an Americanization narrative emerged from playing sports that connected Jewish athleticism 
with full acceptance and integration into American society. And of course, the acceptance was not without struggle, but Jews succeeded and participated in the American sporting culture as athletes, coaches, owners, and as fans. It's a really interesting volume. I urge you all to take a look. And now I'm delighted to introduce Paul Lerner, my colleague in the History Department, who's chair of the Niemer Committee, who will introduce our speakers this evening. Paul. Good evening. Thank you very much, Steve. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And um, I want to also um, second <clears throat> our gratitude to Ruth Weisberg and the, um, the USC Initiative for Israeli Arts and Humanities, which she directs, for their role in helping bring this event about tonight. Um, it's really an extraordinary pleasure to introduce Eva Iluz tonight. Um, and the um, one of what makes my job as chair of the Niemer Committee so fulfilling is the opportunity to um, get to know the work and profile of people who I otherwise may not um, come across. And so kind of um, dipping into Professor Iluz's work over the last months has been um, incredibly stimulating. Um, I, I, I'll keep my remarks short, but um, I just want to note that what I think makes her such an, an ideal choice um, to deliver this lecture is that she is both a scholar of extraordinary depth and nuance and a public intellectual. And uh, I think that combination is, is, is relatively rare. Um, she was born in Fez, Morocco, and um, studied literature and communication, receiving degrees um, from the University of Paris 10 and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She holds a PhD in communications from the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania. Since 2010, she's been the Rose Isaac Chair in Sociology at Hebrew University and has been the director of the Center for the Study of Rationality at Hebrew University also, and served as president of the Betzalel Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem. Her scholarly work, um, well, let me preface that by saying, as a, I mentioned uh, that she's a public in intellectual. Uh, I suppose she's familiar to many of you from her regular columns in Haaretz, where she presents, I think, a very incisive um, and informed commentary on affairs of uh, Israeli politics and society. Um, her scholar scholarly work is characterized by, um, I would say, a very open engagement with popular culture, um, combined with a very deep grounding in, in theoretical work, um, including um, most of all, I would say, the Frankfurt School gender theory and media studies. Um, she's, an ex as I've mentioned, a very prolific and distinguished scholar. I don't want to take too much time by naming all of her publications and awards, but let me just single out several of them. Um, her most recent book publication is Hardcore Romance, Fifty Shades of Grey, Bestsellers and Society, um, which is extremely topical given the upcoming release of the new film. Um, and uh, I guess one could insert one joke, a joke here about tie-ins, but I'm not going to. Um, this was published in 2014 um, by the University of Chicago Press. Um, her 2012 book, Why Love Hurts, A Sociological Explanation, which was originally published in German, um, received um, the best book prize from the American Sociological Association. Among her other works are a 2008 book called Saving the Modern Soul, Therapy, Emotions, and the Culture of Self-Help, published by University of California Press. Um, a 2003 book um, published by Columbia about Oprah Winfrey and the Glamour of Misery. Um, and a, um, a, a book from, two, from I'm just, I'm skipping many of them. Um, a 1997 work called Consuming the Romantic Utopia, Love and the Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism. Um, again, she's won too many prizes to name, but the one that I want to single out here is the um, Annalisa Meyer um, Prize from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in Germany um, for excellence in research. Um, she uh, will be speaking um, to us tonight, as you know, on At the Heart of Israel, Romantic Love as Politics by Other Means. So please welcome Professor Eva Iluz. Thank you. 
you very much, Paul, for this wonderful introduction. Um, it's a great honor to be here, truly. I want to thank the Kasdan Institute, and um, I want to thank the USC Initiative for Israel Arts and Humanities for inviting me. Um, so before I start this lecture, I would like to offer three caveats or um, ways of interpreting or receiving the lecture. I'm going to try to understand or to analyze the cultural model of the family and love in Israel um, in the beginning years of the country. And for those of you who are not familiar with sociology, um, it is possible that the style of my lecture will sound very general, as you know, as if I was giving you uh, generalities to which each one of you can think um, about um, counterexamples. Um, so let me say just to start that this is how um, sociologists think. Um, sociologists are trying to find out about general norms, outlooks, and values. And it, it doesn't mean that we think that the reality complies with that, but it simply means that we think that these norms and values act as magnetic fields, you know, as magnetic, they have a kind of magnetic force um, which we want to account for even though we know that these are not deterministic forces, they don't shape um, uh, practices um, in a very mechanic way. Um, my second caveat um, is that uh, from time to time, I will compare Israel and the United States. Um, when I do that, I don't mean to say that one model is superior to another. Rather, what cultural sociologists do quite often, is they use comparison as a way to probe thinking. You need a comparative standpoint in order a, to be able to see something you would not be able to see otherwise. You need to see the specificity of what you're analyzing, and to do that, comparing often helps. And um, my third caveat is that I analyze, or I'm going to talk about images, or as we say, <coughs> discourses, and not practices. Um, I am fully aware of the difference, obviously. Um, but I think that um, representations or images shape at least partly practices. So again, keep that in mind, please, when you hear me, because I'm sure that um, some of you or many of you will have a, um, a, a, an intuitive sense that these are um, abstract descriptions that do not necessarily fit the real practices um, but this is how sociologists work, and I'm very, I would be very happy to discuss more in depth this methodology in the Q&A uh, session. So um, after these caveats, let me start. Um, second wave feminism has profoundly transformed our understanding of the emotion of love. Contrary to popular mythology, Feminists have argued that love is not a source of transcendence, happiness, and self-realization. Rather, romantic love is one of the main causes of the divide between men and women, as well as one of the cultural practices through which women are made to accept and love, in fact, their submission to men. For when in love, men and women continue to perform the deep divisions that characterize their respective identities. In Simone de Beauvoir's famous words, even in love, men retain their sovereignty while women aim to abandon themselves. In her controversial and famous dialectic of, sale, of sex, Shulamit Firestone goes a step further. She says that the source of men's social power and energy is the love women have provided them and continue to provide them with, thus suggesting that love is the cement 
with which the edifice of male domination has been built. Romantic love then not only hides a class and sex segregation, but in fact makes it possible. That is, only love perpetuates the deep inequality of men and women. These critiques of love have been reinforced by feminist historians which have examined the constitution of the private and public spheres in the 19th century, in America especially. And um, the fairly conventional claim is that in organizing work and manufacture in factories, capitalism irrevocably destroyed domestic production and made invisible the work of women who supported the engine of capitalism without being remunerated, and for that matter, without being even considered as workers. Having been barred from participating in the public sphere as citizens and as workers, women in the 19th century, and also a good part of the 20th century, were reduced to their domestic work and roles as mothers and wives. The confinement of women in the private sphere was narrow, limiting, disempowering, and in turn prevented women from acquiring self-mastery and political sovereignty. As Michael Kimmel suggests, it is customary to see the 19th century as a period where women were, I quote, domestic prisoners locked into the whole by an ideology of feminine domesticity and Christian piety and virtue, end of quote. Without a doubt, one of the emotional and ideological pillars supporting and justifying the edifice of the private sphere was the ideal of romantic love as it came to occupy the center stage of American culture from the 19th century onward. It is thus not surprising that romantic love, which is the fulcrum of the private sphere, has been viewed then as an instrument of women's continued subordination to men. This also explains why feminist scholars have attacked liberalism as the theory which holds that the existence of a private sphere free of the intervention of the state is crucial for, uh, I'm sorry, it, thus, it's not surprising that feminists have attacked liberalism, which I would define as the political theory which holds that the existence of a private sphere must be free of the intervention of the state, and because that freedom is crucial for the exercise of personal freedom. Liberalism has been indicted as the political arrangement which, albeit premised on the family, has made its values invisible and has made the family invisible, as it has made the women who are central in the family invisible. So for that reason, perhaps we sense often in feminist scholarship a longing or nostalgia for societies in which a private sphere would be weak, in which private sphere would be only weakly developed. So for example, anthropologists Michel Rosaldo, who was also a prominent feminist, has argued that women's status will be lowest in societies where there is a firm differentiation between domestic and public spheres. So, um, in fact, so I would say that a lot of feminist critiques of, um, of, of the status of women in the private sphere is also very much connected to the feminist critique of liberalism and liberal society. The question I want to raise is a small one, and it is this one. Israel offers the example of a polity in which the private sphere is very weakly indeed differentiated, or was at least very weakly differentiated from the public sphere. It offers a very good example of a communitarian society, quite opposite to the model of liberal polity. And so I just want to ask, does this entail, as some feminist theorists would argue, so as some feminist critiques of liberalism would argue, a more equalitarian gender relations? What impact do, does such model of society have for models of romantic love? 
I want to examine this question by examining the cultural code of the family and love in Israeli society, a society that has been consistently characterized as dominated by a strong communitarian ethos and by the fact that the public sphere is much less differentiated from the private sphere than in a liberal polity as the United States. So before I start my analysis, let me just say that I am a sociologist of culture and sociologist of emotions, and that for sociologists of emotions and culture, emotions are not universal properties of human beings. They're not physiological reactions, but rather that they um, are embedded. Emotions for sociologists like me are embedded in cultural scripts, in moral categories, and in views of the person, in views of selfhood that vary and that change historically and culturally. So emotions may have the same word. We may have the same word to say, we, we may say romantic love since um, time immemorial, but in fact, the same word can cover very different social experiences. This is a basic premise of my work. Romantic love, more than other emotions, is, a, uh, is an emotion that is uh, uh, em embedded in public symbols and rituals and collective stories. And um, for example, it means quite simply that the ways in which people love uh, today, in 2015, is quite different than the ways in which they even loved 50 years ago. And I'm willing to defend that position if you want in the Q&A session. I will not um, uh, get into it, simply take it as a premise of my work. And like other emotions, or even more than other emotions, love is of supreme sociological interest because at stake in love is the social institution of marriage, which is crucial to society. Because marriage is the, is the institution which ensures both biological reproduction and economic strategies of social mobility, it is the object of social control, discourse, and representations, much more massively than most other emotions we know of. Um, this also explains why romantic love of all emotions is probably the most widely and relentlessly depicted in cultural media, in popular culture, in high culture, and the one about which there is the highest level of public cultural um, discussion. So I write for this paper, what I research is the public images and discourses of love. And as I said at the beginning, these public images and discourses point not exactly to actual practices, but to the prevalent norms, to the general guidelines which shape these practices. And to that end, I'm going even to focus more specifically on what uh, subcultural sociologists call a cultural code, which can be defined very broadly as a conceptual system which is organized around key oppositions and equations. So for example, think about the Hollywood cinema of the 1940s and 1950s, or even before, where you have the um, character of uh, the femme fatale, or the dangerous women, or the sexual women. That um, character of the dangerous women, the sexual women, makes sense to us culturally only because she is opposed to the virtuous woman who is sexually chaste, or at least whose sexuality is more tightly connected to marriage. That kind of opposition, for example, that kind of cultural code of the dangerous woman because sexualized women would be uh, less relevant today in an era where sexuality is far more open and authorized. So through cultural code, social reality is interpreted, shared, and acted upon, and therefore of crucial interest to a cultural sociologist. But cultural codes are not only discourses, they're not only images, they have a social basis. Cultural meanings are enacted through social institutions and organizations. In the case of love, it's easy to identify key institutions. 
um, that are likely to play a central role in shaping these cultural codes. Um, one key cultural institution is religion. Another key cultural institution is the economic structure. Another key institution is the private-public divide. And finally, the legislation. So to get a sense of the cultural code of love in Israel, I looked at public images of love in, women's mag in one women's magazine, which was the most popular one at the time of the creation of the State of Israel. And because until the 1970s, the, televisi the television was underdeveloped, there was only uh, one public channel, and because Israelis' media's orientation was directed much more to news than to the display of lifestyle until the 1970s, it is reasonable to assume that at least until the 1970s, which is the period where I stop, uh, women's magazines played a significant cultural role in guiding, instructing, and exposing women to models and theories of love and femininity. Um, Another reason for examining women's magazines is that, by definition, this popular literature is highly gendered and therefore highly informative on the cultural codes through which women are socialized to play and do their gender role. This is true of Israel as well as of the United States and many other countries. And in the United States, we can say that from the 19th century onward, American women have been the object and target of advice by a vast number of experts, clerics, secular moralists, psychologists, physicians, who through counseling and moral guidance shaped and defined the role and duty of women as wives, mothers, and women. Um, <coughs> so, um, this analysis is based on a, a, a sample of um, a few hundreds articles um, from uh, 1948, the date of the creation of the State of Israel, until 1978. And the examples I'm going to give you are examples that are all characteristics, that is, only those um, um, articles that were very, uh, that offered themes that were very recurrent will be uh, quoted. The magazine Laisha is the one I selected for this study because it enjoyed uh, the widest circulation among Israeli women. Um, and because um, also it, was, it is an interesting magazine because quite until quite late, it was many of the articles were actually written by men under female pseudonyms. <laughs> so you understand why I think it is particularly relevant. So um, let me start by saying that the socioeconomic context of Israel presents chief attributes of a communitarian polity, as I said before. Both politically and symbolically, the first decades of the state of Israel were um, um, dominated by a social Zionist ethos that was propagated by the labor movement or the Mapai party. As historian Zev Sternel has claimed, I quote, the labor movement provided Israeli society with such a strong model of development that even after its fall from power in 1977, no real changes occurred in the economic, cultural, and social life in Israel. One of the labor movement's basic ideological components was to establish a communal society that would be based on centralized supervision over the market and the, the society, and in which national, nationalization of private assets would bring forth equality of wages, consumption, and social status. The individual was expected to relinquish any private needs and aspirations if these did not match with the collective needs of the society. So, as you know, various cooperative organizations were established as a way of implementing these visions, kibbutzim, moshavim, etc. Free professions such as physicians and lawyers were far less valued than in European countries, with the chalutz, the pioneer, taking the forefront of cultural and normative imagery. <coughs> 
the pioneer, which combined images of agricultural hard work and fearless soldiers' spirit, was supposed to be moved by the needs of the community, primarily the national community. So although the importance of the private sector to th was um, acknowledged, the public sector won more economic and um, normative incentives. The Israeli market was not guided, as in its American counterpart, by an ideology of rationality and efficiency, but rather by ethno-religious and national considerations, such as the colonization of the land. So Laisha, um, you know, when I perused through the articles for the first 30, uh, first 30 years of the existence of Israel, the first thing that was very obvious is that um, the theme of love, of romantic love, was in fact far less prominent than its equivalent in American magazines. Instead, the bulk of the articles in the 1950s address the importance of the family. In one article dated from 1948, the author, for example, tells about a conversation she overhears between two civilians, parents of two children, and two women soldiers. In this overheard conversation, the soldiers, the women soldiers, suggest that in times of distress and war, it is not appropriate to start a family and give birth to more children. This brings the mother's furious respo re response, which is also the right response, uh, the one that the author of the article espouses. And she writes, we should not speak such words, let alone in times of war. Who, in your opinion, will fill the places of the missing sons? The soldier, thus the women soldiers, thus inquires about her comfort while she will have to care of her children alone in her husband's absence, to which the woman responds that comfortable, easy, these are selfish terms. Please put them out of your vocabulary. We ought to turn every job and duty easy and comfortable in these days. The author of the article mentioned that in the end, the women convinced the soldiers. So the idea of the family expressed here is extremely strong. This is co personal comfort is banned. And um, this is, in fact, quite equivalent to the Republican ideal of the family, which was advocated by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, and which was very present in America in the 19th century, but which disappeared afterwards. So just let me quote Jean-Jacques Rousseau to uh, explain what is this Republican ideal. This is Rousseau um, who writes, can devotion to the state exist apart from the love of those near and dear to us? Can patriotism thrive except in the soil of that miniature fatherland, the home? Is it not the good son, the good husband, the good father who makes the good citizen?" End of quote. Rousseau excluded women from his view of citizenship yet viewed the family as the indispensable soil on which the future citizen should and could grow. The family is, in fact, a micro-political community, for in it, individuals are educated to care and sacrifice for the benefit of the greater community. Um, let me give you another example, which attests to the cultural importance of the army and the nation with reference to romantic practices in Israel. Um, so in this article, um, we have four, uh, the story of four women who married their partners after the male was handicapped due to war wounds. The author of the article begins the article by stating that from time to time she reads in the newspapers about handicapped men, all war heroes, who marry beautiful women. The purpose of the article is thus to find out what compels these women to marry handicapped men. Most revealing are the words of two of the women interviewed. One of them says that her future husband had no doubt that he would recuperate after his injury for he was proud, he was a proud injured man. After all, 
This happened to him in the army and not due to an accident. In the same vein, in answering the question whether she was embarrassed to be seen in public with her one-legged husband, another woman stated, uh, not her husband, partner, another woman stated that when you're the girlfriend of an IDF's handicapped man, it is an honor. He is not handicapped as a result of a car accident. So uh, clearly here, the handicapped man stands for a symbol of the national community. Um, and the hardship of the relationship is subsumed or attenuated by the social prestige conferred by his handicapped. So my point here is to suggest that love is here very closely associated, um, I mean, or, or romantic love is associated with images that um, in other countries would have been quite unusual, which is the image of a handicapped man. Then where women's magazines in the American context celebrated a youthful and healthy body as the condition to find love, Laisha clearly subordinated the sexual body to the collective body to the state. Thus, through the family, women were made participants in the project of nation building and were made to subsume private feelings and their public duty to the state. Yet, in the same way that the family was shot through by notions of the collective good, women occupy the public sphere by caring for men as mothers. In that way, we may say that the continuity between the private and public spheres was seamless. It is, not, it is thus not surprising that the ideal typical women posited by the magazine Laisha of the 1950s onward is one who had realized herself in motherhood and who viewed her role as echoing her contribution to the community and collective effort. Family and motherhood define not only the good women, but femininity at large. Let, us, let me take then the example of an exchange between two women presented by the magazine as contrasted opposites. Such cultural oppositions, as I said before with my notion of cultural code, are useful for the cultural analysts because these oppositions enact cultural meanings. So um, this is uh, one woman, presumably writing to another woman, and the article is titled A Candid Letter to the Other Woman. And it presents a letter from a single woman to a married woman whose husband she is having an affair with. It is thus a letter from the mistress to the wife. In this letter, the lover explains why it is right for the husband to be unfaithful to his wife. The main reason lies in the outward appearance of the wife. So the mistress writes, never, never will I look like you. A woman who neglects her external appearance is stupid. In the following issue of the magazine, the reply is offered in which the wife explains that the neglect of her appearance is caused by her desire to raise and maintain a family. The wife writes, I don't think that I didn't make it as a woman. We, and women like us, devoted our most beautiful years to starting a family. For other things outside marriage, we don't have neither talent nor training. I don't agree that any other women that succeeded in maintaining her looks and lives her life in an atmosphere of beauty parlors, theaters, and offices has the right to take our husbands away from us. So there is, if you want here, an explicit rejection of the model of femininity that was dominant in the world, um, and especially in the US, which is a model of femininity that was sexualized, that was defined by the industries of beauty, and that subscribe to what sociologists call recreational sexuality, that is, sexuality for pleasure, as opposed to sexuality for reproduction. Both the mistress letter and the reply constitute a discussion on the definition of the good femininity and was an articulated an opposition between the feminine women and the mother, with the mother obviously being the good model. The feminine woman is construed here as an erotic creature 
and concerned with procreation and the family. Again, this is quite seriously different from Europe and the US at the time where womanhood and femininity were uh, highly sexualized. This um, um, reflects, I think, quite directly state priorities. In Israel, personal wel welfare was largely defined by collective wel welfare, which demanded high rates of fertility. The Israeli family was legitimated, in fact, by a discourse of fertility rather than by a view of happiness and well-being. In other words, again, in throughout the 20th century, um, the family, the modern family, was mostly justified um, by um, the idea that only through the family and domesticity people would find happiness and well-being, whereas um, the motive of fertility was far more prominent in Israeli discourse. For example, another article entitled The Birth Rate Decreasing deals with the influence of not having organized and subsidized daycare centers on the possibility of women to fulfill themselves in the public sphere. If, if such centers are not made available, the article held, then women would have to give up the freedom they had achieved in order to protect their family, here equated with a large family. So really, fertility was is presented consistently as the obligatory task of men and women. Um, um, another article I quote, every woman in Israel knows that we must increase the birth rate. So it is interesting again that why the family in liberal societies has been justified on purely emotional and individualist grounds, the family in Israel was a direct expression or extension of the state and the community in its orientation to high birth rate, in turn congruent with the Zionist goals of settling the land and increasing the population. Israeli family, in fact, until today, has a quite original pattern, as is confirmed by Israeli sociologists of the family today, because the Israeli, Israelis, for example, marry more than Europeans or Americans, far more. They divorce less. They have a much higher birth rate than uh, the European or American family. This is also explained by the control of personal status laws by Orthodox religious clergy, whose conceptions of women, procreation, and marriage permeate, so to speak, the general social fabric of marriage. So Israel's pro-natalist legislation find expressions, for example, in the very large allowances that the government invests in promoting the development and use of new reproductive technologies. In fact, the, Israel is the country that is most general in the world in its assistance of technology-assisted uh, pregnancy. So this is a reflection of the same cultural model. State policy and religious laws, religious culture, combine with cultural schemas provided by religious, um, religious Jewish tradition. And this combination explain the power and spread of this specific model of the family. Indeed, as sociologist Baruch Kilmerling has showed, a significant part of Zionism political decisions were embedded within the cultural tradition of, of Judaism. And this is contrary to the view that Zionism was a purely secular movement. A central ethos regarding sexuality and love operated throughout Jewish history and that ethos specified that reproductive sexuality and Jewish identity were deeply associated with each other. This is confirmed by David Bialy's um, magnificent book, Eros and the Jews. So this model of the family thus was focused on children and was clearly distinct from the model which had dominated American society from the 19th century onward, which historian John Demos has called the model of the hothouse family, which is, I think, the model that most of you would be familiar with. This is a model in which the number of children was reduced increasingly from the, the mid-19th century onward, where gender roles became specialized and differentiated, 
and where the family became a hot house of emotions. That's uh, the name that John Demos gave to it, especially of an intense emotional bond between uh, the men and the women. In Israel, in contrast, children, rather than the romantic love of the couple, were the focus of the family unit. So this means, in turn, that romantic love was not as differentiated and distinct from the family ideal as it had been in Europe and the US. That is, familism rather than romanticism was the purpose of the heterosexual relation. This was accompanied by another striking difference between the US and Israel with regard to the moral status of women. In the 19th century in the US, as a result of the temperance movement, women were granted a very high moral status. In fact, women were viewed as morally superior to men. They were viewed as pure, as angel and angelic. In the Israeli context, you do not find, I could not find any trace of that kind of moral status to women, um, as had been the case in um, America. Um, for example, in an article titled, Help Your Husband Be Faithful to You, um, sorry. the author addresses the question of what women must do for their husbands to remain faithful to them. A woman must constantly monitor her husband's behavior. She must, I quote, perceive in time the warning signals and act accordingly. A middle-aged man fears being old and needs constant reassurance. Therefore, his wife must be careful not to criticize or hurt him. I quote, if the wife gives him this reassurance, he will not look for other women, end of quote. Thus, although the report concludes with the remark that a woman is not the only one to be blamed in the case of her husband's infidelity, but in fact, this is the very conclusion that the reader is forced to come up with at the end of the article. In contrast, in the 19th century, in the US, um, the male practice of the double standard was um, one of the strong moral batters, battles which helped affirm the moral status of women as women, um, and thanks to which, in fact, women claimed equality to men. Through the temperance movement in the 19th century, um, women acquired a moral leverage um, and women organized moral crusades for men to reform the practice of the double standard, thus in fact claiming equality on the basis of a higher moral status they had been granted in the realm of love and sexuality. So towards the end of the 19th century, members of clergy, of clergy moralists and educators praised women for having, I quote, all the milder virtues of humanity and a more exquisite sensibility than men, the God of heaven has more exquisitely attuned their sensibility than men should to love, to sympathy, and to compassion, end of quote. Because they recognized women's superiority in the domestic spheres, then men had to accommodate their behavior and personality to women. This is a process that sociologist Francesca Kantian has called the process of feminization of love. That is, this was a process where men were progressively drawn into the private sphere and were made to accept women's superiority and transformed their, um, the model of masculinity to become more gentle, more emotionally expressive, um, etc. To provide another example of the ways in which Israeli women were not posited as having the moral superiority which was taken for granted in America, this is an article about three young women who complain about the improper behavior of men while they are in their company. The counselor writing the article replies that you should know that these men are usually good men, serious and clever. Their conduct toward women is dependent on her she has to know how to put a guy in his place, not being overly strict, angry, or punitive, with laughter, a sharp word, with delicate firmness. 
So while in the American context, the rowdiness of men was almost always condemned, men um, were the, uh, with men uh, being the ones who had to watch their behavior carefully in order to meet the sta moral standards of women, here it is clearly the women who had to adopt her conduct to that of the man, uh, however demeaning his behavior might have been. Thus, in another article, a woman writes, for example, that she cannot conceive of children. Um, she and her husband con are considering adoption. He wants um, a boy, she wants a girl. And the response is that she must give in to her husband. You must understand your husband. Every man instinctively wishes for the continuation of his name. Um, so therefore, if you, um, um, therefore, we advise you to adopt a son, a child is a child. In other words, I'm suggesting simply that we do not have here a realm in which women were, so to speak, um, uh, deferred to, viewed as su superior morally in the private sphere. This is because, I believe, it is men who, in virtue of their role in the army, were granted, in fact, the higher moral status. I think this is the main reason why we have this very sharp difference in the moral status of women. As Eyal ben Ari, the anthropologist of the army, of Israeli army, has argued, army compulsory service demands both of men and women strong emotional control, endurance, overcoming of fear, and strong solidarity with their group of operation. Thus, the image of a strong and muscular masculine body was central to the main codes and tropes of Israeli masculinity. And these many Israeli scholars have showed that over and over again. What makes this muscular body masculine um, and morally superior are its military feats, its ability to sacrifice itself to the collective and to control fear and other negative emotions. In contradistinction to Western European masculinity, Israeli masculinity was not molded in a tradition of courtship, which demanded an attention to rituals, to emotional expressivity, to the capacity to defer to the moral status of women. Absent from the nascent Israeli culture were models of courtship and rituals to display one's social distinction and one's masculinity. There are a few reasons. One is that the main cultural and linguistic code forged and conveyed by the army is that of what anthropologist Tamar Cartriel has called the Dugri speech. This is a very dominant code to speak in Israel. Um, and the Dugri speech is the dominant linguistic code regulating Israeli social interactions, and it has its source in the army. It is a form of speech in which directness is preferred to allusion, reference to concrete and practical matters are preferred to the spiritual or the emotional, and expression of familiarity is preferred to deference or formal distance. Such linguistic code importantly differs from American romantic linguistic code, which stresses indirectness, emotional expressivity, and male deference to the women. The powerful cultural influence of the army on women is felt in yet another respect. The army enables two main modes of articulation of women's identity. As sociologist Orna Sasson Levy showed, one mode is by making women adopt and imitate male identity in the army. The second is by making them adopt the identity of the protective mother who takes care of the needs of men in the army. In that respect, we may say that the army reinforces the fact that womanhood is organized around and defined by hegemonic masculinity. In other words, women are not distinct. They are, on the contrary, through the army, they are made to imitate the masculine code. Um, either by playing the role of mothers or by erasing gender differences altogether. So, if since the 1920s, one of the main institutional source for the codification 
of masculinity in America has been the corporation and the market, which entailed a strong individualization of masculinity through practices of competition and self-reliance. By contrast, the world of the Israeli male was not the firm, was not the business world, the business world but rather the army and the community, which both revolve around the key experience of solidarity with other men and not competition with other men. So in the same way that the business world institutionalized in America codes of manhood, the Israeli army has been the main institutions providing codes of masculinity. Um, why is that important? Because through such um, code of masculinity in the army, one of the main experiences of men is solidarity with other men. On the other hand, American men perceive other men as competitors and as potential threats that can rob them of their masculinity in power. This is why in America, the family, the private realm, domesticity, and women in that realm were viewed as a haven, as a refuge from a harsh world. Um, and so this is why in America also, because you have this imagery of the family as a haven from the harsh world of the market competition, there was a strong emphasis on a model of femininity that was gentle and compassionate, as opposite to the impersonal, competitive, harsh world of the market. On the other hand, the Israeli man is much more likely than his American counterpart to view other men as a source of strength and support, with the result, if you want, that the Israeli woman is not posited and constructed as the beautiful soul who heals, soothes, and calms the wounds inflicted on the man, on her man, by other men. The world of reference of the Israeli man was other men, he received affection, solidarity, and brotherhood from these other men. Um, so, so in this way, this is my main point here, it is that Israeli women were not posited as opposite to males, uh, to their male uh, realm, but rather as replica of the very qualities that men demanded from each other. So let me summarize and move to my conclusion. I have claimed that during the first 30 formative years of the country, we have an original model of love and the family characterized by the seamless continuity of the family and the public sphere, by the orientation of women to reproductive sexuality rather than recreational sexuality, by familism rather than romanticism, by the orientation of the family to fertility, by the absence of a differentiated and elaborate sphere of romance and sexuality, and by the fact that women did not have, as in the US, a higher moral status than that of men. Rather, women derived their moral status from supporting and enhancing the moral status of men soldiers. So the Israeli case would perhaps invite us to revise, or at least nuance, the feminist critique of liberalism of the private sphere and of love. Many of the attacks on the private sphere and on the emotion supposed to preside over the private sphere, that is romantic love, are part of a broader, broader rejection of liberalism. Um, and so it is not surprising that many feminists have rejected liberalism because, um, um, because feminism self-proclaimed task has been to take women out of the isolation and confinement of the private sphere and um, to take issue with the most fundamental assumption of liberalism, namely that the private sphere is the realm uh, that is free of external influence, mostly of the state. Um, so um, I would say that the reason why my study invites us to um, uh, rethink this is that um, liberalism, I believe, um, well, no, sorry, let me just quote here 
what, um, uh, let me quote at a um, fuller extent the quote with which I started before, which embodies and exemplifies um, this view by Michel Rosaldo, namely the view that women's status will be lowest in those societies where there is a firm differentiation between domestic and public spheres of activity, and where women are isolated from one another and placed under a single man's authority in the home. Rosaldo further suggests that perhaps the most egalitarian societies are those in which public and domestic spheres are weakly differentiated. But as I hope to have illustrated, the Israeli case, in the Israeli case, gender relations are um, more similar. They are, that, that is, men and women are indeed more similar. They're not clearly differentiated as in a liberal polity. Um, so the, they're not clearly differentiated, yet they're not equal at all, as I hope to have suggested, at least in the model I drew. Not only is the ideology of romantic love far less prominent in Israel than in the American continent, but Israeli women have been allowed to bear arms and to participate actively in the, in the army and have not been essentialized and locked in a rigid ideology of femininity as in the American case and have not been isolated from the public sphere as their American counterpart. So there seems to be something that is more equalitarian and yet I would say that because masculinity in Israel is institutionalized in key organization as the army and functions symbolically as if it was the collective body writ large, and because the private sphere is not opposed to the public sphere, but rather subservient to it, Israeli women have had to align themselves more closely around hegemonic definitions of masculinity, which in the Israeli cont context defined them and validated them primarily and only as mothers. In this context, let me thus simply raise, end with a question. In liberal polities, hasn't romantic love been then a cultural agent of individualization and autonomy for women? By using the Israeli model of the family and its inscription in the communitarian polity as a reference point, I want to suggest that perhaps the private sphere and its strong emphasis on subjectivity, on emotions, its emphasis on love and romance has been an agent of the feminization of masculinity and of the autonomization and of the autonomy of women's um, inner life and subjectivity. In other words, in communitarian polities as Israel, romantic love is subsumed under families, familism, and this may turn out to have been a far more powerful site for the perpetuation of patriarchy than romantic love. Thank you. I want to <clears throat> thank Professor, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to thank Professor Elouz for a, an extremely thought provoking, um, fascinating lecture. And I'm sure um, uh, the discussion we can flow in many different directions right now. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our respondent, um, who will um, have some remarks um, pertaining to the lecture, and after which we will have a, a, a short Q&A session. Um, our respondent is Donny Leiner Foss, who's an assistant professor of sociology here at USC, where he's taught since 2009. Um, he has been a faculty fellow here um, through the Kasdan Institute, and um, is the author of a 2013 book called Sinews of the Nation, Constructing Irish and Zionist Bonds in the US, um, which was published by Polity. Um, let me just mention also that um, Donny has been, um, or among his many interests are um, Jewish philanthropy, um, the Israel lobby, and uh, masculinity um, <clears throat> in various contexts. So um, please join me in welcoming Donnie Leiner-Voss.
Thank you, Paul, for this wonderful introduction. It is always nice to hear all these nice things about me. Please continue. All will go. Let's continue later. <laughs> In private, maybe. And thank you for the Nimer family and the Kasdan Institute for making it possible for us to meet once a year and listen to thought-provoking lectures in such a nice, pleasant atmosphere. I'm truly honored to serve as a discussant for this paper. It is rare for me to meet such towering inter intellectual figures that had tremendous influence on my own thinking, let alone comment on their work. This is tru truly exceptional. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Eva Illouz invites us to consider a counterintuitive proposition. Rather than taking romantic love as a ahistorical universal emotion, Illouz treats love as a sociological phenomenon. Different polities give ground to different forms of intimate relationships. On the one hand, this is almost obvious. We all realize that in pre-modern societies, for example, People experienced interpersonal relationship very, different, very differently than we are today. To some extent, we all realize that our current notion of romantic love is recent. But Illuz asks us to take a step further and to examine to how different contemporaneous modern polities affect gender relations and the possibility, possibilities that thereby inher for romantic love. To ground this proposition empirically, Illouz compares the Israeli and American cases. In the liberal polity of the United States, romantic love is tied with the relatively strict distinction between public and private sphere. Contra radical feminist critiques, Illouz argues that in the United States, the separation of spheres created a space where romantic love can develop as an individual affair giving women opportunity to exercise choice and experience self-fulfillment. In the communitarian polity of Israel, in contrast, the distinction between the spheres is less pronounced. The men's that originate from the public spheres, from the public sphere, penetrate the public sphere, producing new meanings to intimate romantic affairs. Importantly, since masculine institutions like the military and state religion in Israel powerfully shape the public sphere in Israel. So the Israeli version of hegemonic masculinity also informs interpersonal relations in that place. Rather than finding themselves in reciprocal relationship, Israeli, Israeli women find themselves in a position of mothering again and again, attending to the needs of others even in the relations with their partners. I find this analysis highly inno innovative and persuasive, but still, I believe that the argument would benefit from further elaboration, specifically from linking your current analysis with your pure previous work. In Why Love Hurts and other previous books, you developed groundbreaking analysis of romantic love in the modern age. In a nutshell, you show, how, you show us how the development of modern psychology and various dating services fundamentally altered the experience of romantic love from an, from an ineffable, impulsive, and mysterious force. Love has become an emotion that is tailored to the needs of the individual. It became an emotional experience that is harnessed to a utilitarian project of the self, a project in which one has to secure maximum pleasure and well-being. Think, for example, about the example of, on the case of Romeo and Juliet, this kind of all-absorbing love that leads the couple into some kind of path of self-destruction. In, mo in modern age, this type of destructive self-love is an issue of interest for psychologists, is, is like a it's a mistake that individuals are asked to rectify. Otherwise, their well-being will not be there. So how can we tie your argument about romantic love 
in liber liberal versus communitarian, communitarian regimes to this inspiring analysis. On the one hand, it looks as if the existence of a sheltered private sphere allowed for the development of unique self-empowering experience of romantic love. On the other hand, it looks as if the same liberal private sphere also fundamentally flattened the meaning of romantic love through a process of what Weber calls rationalization. I will be grateful if you can later elaborate on this. I would also ask you to tie your analysis with the second line of your work. In a series of articles that were published in Haaretz, you developed what I find brilliant critique of Israeli politics. Your analysis focuses on the tension between the universalist, universalist ideals of the Enlightenment, which informed certain strands of Zionism, and diasporic particularist Jewish ideas, which today find chauvinist expression in Israel. I find this series of articles hugely important contribution to Israel public discourse. And I wonder, is there a link? Is there a way to connect your work on gender with your work on politics, or this work on politics? Finally, to bring the issues that we are discussing here a bit closer to home, that is, to LA in this case, I wonder if we can use the framework that you offered us to better understand the unique situation of American Jews. Let me explain what I have in mind. While American Jews live in a liberal regime, even a casual obse observer of Jewish American public discussion will recognize that within this community, the boundaries between private and public are not always clear. Think, for example, about the never-ending discussion on marriage and intermarriage. The facts here are well known. A large proportion of American Jews marry non-Jews. Moreover, non-Orthodox Jewish Americans tend to marry later or not marry at all. And when they marry, they have less children. The debate about what this means is raging, and I do not intend to add my three cents to this discussion here. What I want to point, however, is that at least in this respect, the debate of American Jews looks very much like the discussion that you described earlier in Israel. Marriage and family formation are continuous with the public sphere. The good of the nation, or the good of the community in this case, penetrates and informs the public sphere, the, sorry, the private sphere. How this penetration is affecting romantic love and the status of women within the Jewish American community. I'm not sure about how we should understand this, but my hunch is that we can all be relieved. Unlike the situation in Israel, in the United States, there are no powerful institutions similar to the Israeli state religion or the military that enforce hegemonic masculinity and penetrate the private sphere to the same extent. As a result, even when key figures raise concern about fertility and the future of the nation, this concern is articulated with a distinct liberal tone. Jane Eisner, the editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, which was here uh, a year or two ago, illustrates this nicely. In an in an editorial column that focused on the problem of marriage and intermarriage, Eisner sounds deeply alarmed. The non-Orthodox birth rate in America is far below replacement level, she cries. But she ends with the column with a different tone. Here I quote, we need to figure out how to honor individual choice and the desire to move beyond ghettoization with a communal need to promote marriage as the foundation of a healthy Jewish culture. Perhaps we, perhaps we straight folks can learn something from the gay and lesbians who have fought so bravely for their right to marry, a right, a duty, a joy, and a privilege which we are allowing ourselves to slip away. This short paragraph, I believe, shows an interesting thing. In the absence of 
social institutions that imposed public concern, public concerns on the private sphere, the solution to communal crisis follows a path that is different from the one adopted in Israel, a solution that is in, informed by progressive liberal ideas. Far from contesting Illus's argument, I believe that this small example illustrates its validity in a different in a different case and tells us something about the condition of romantic love in the US, in the Jewish American community. One last thing before I finish, I think I wanna commend you on, on the type of analysis that you offered. The field of Israel studies in the United States is a kind of, is booming. And oftentimes scholars take upon themselves to study Israel in isolation. I believe that this is a intellectual approach that, is made, that leads to many interesting insights and marginal, marginalization of the field as a whole. What you do is something quite different. You're using Israel as a kind of test case to study, to compare and study against the United States in a way that allows allows scholars that are interested in Israel, like myself, to escape this marginalization, to make a claim that resonates and affects a much more general, broad audience. Uh, so thank you for this work. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tani. We, um, as you may notice, we're running a little bit late tonight, so we're going to have time for only a short question and answer session. I, we can take a couple of questions, um, but I urge you to keep your questions short and to um, make sure they're actually questions. Yes. Please stand up also. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I think the question is, um, where do you want to draw your comparison? Um, I know uh, quite well uh, American women's magazines um, that are comparable to Laisha. And so one of the things that interested me is simply to uh, 
you know, take these things that are roughly similar and see if I found interesting or important differences. Um, so, the com so in other words, instead of doing a comparison like this inside Israel, I do a comparison like this. Um, so that's my uh, first answer. Then uh, in the um, 1980s, there was a survey taken asking, uh, a, a white survey, I don't remember how many women were asked what was the publication they read. So it was, and, and the, the mag and the publication that was the highest, that got the highest result was Laisha. So in that sense, if you want, even though I agree with you, I think you are absolutely right. I wouldn't quite say it's ghettoized to working class women. I would say it probably reaches also uh, a significant set segment of middle class women. But it, it was the publication until the 1980s that was most widely read by women in Israel. And it was, and it enjoyed uh, uh, a unique status uh, until the 1980s and when other publications came and competed with it. So in that respect, um, I'm not, if you want, if I, if I was, if I had wanted to do a kind of careful, nuanced, class-based um, analysis of uh, Israel, then you're right. I should have taken additional publications and do something more nuanced. But I simply ask myself, what's dominant? What was prevalent? Without really trying to make finer distinctions, which are completely called for, if you want to look at Israeli society in more detail, I simply wanted to see what are the relevant broad distinctions I could see between the prevalent publication in Israel and a, a similar one in the United States. Can I add something to that? Well, I, wa I, wanted, I wanted to... Uh, it's a good idea. <laughs> I wanted to say that I, th I actually think that your comment uh, reinforces the general argument the fact that Laisha, the one publication that deals with lifestyle, even that magazine is picked up only when you go to a beauty parlor, goes to support the idea that this sphere of romantic engagement and all of this was marginalized. It wasn't the mm. magazine that you read on mm. everyday basis. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Rabbi Seidler Flower. was a polar analysis. And, and we had fa familism uh, and patriarchy contrasted with individualism and feminism. And what you suggested was the possibility of a middle ground, when, and when you quoted Jane Eisner. And that's what I think is missing in your analysis, because it seems to me that what we're left with is if we take feminism to be something positive, which I think most of us would, would agree to, as a, as a positive uh, development, and individualism also as a gift of modernity, then uh, if, we, if we go in that direction, then we lose family. And, uh, and, and, and we see that result in the, in, in the emphasis on individualism in America with a decline in, in, in late marriages, decline in children. We see that in Jewish life in a very sort of graphic way. So I, I, I'm just wondering whether or not what we had was, you know, a, a, some sort of synthesis uh, a, a dialectic here with the synthesis that was presented by Danny that offers us for an, a new possibility with some degree of family and a, as well as preserving a, a notion of feminism within the context of an emphasis uh, mm -hmm. on the importance of sustaining family life. I worry about the, co the, the, you know, the, 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 mo the moral consequences of your analysis. Mm. <laughs> well, you took a very, um, I guess, optimistic uh, take on, on what I was suggesting, which I'm not completely sure that, like, 
that is wrong. I agree that Jane Eisner is kind of trying to pave a way that kind of respects individualism and tries to preserve the family somehow. What I'm not sure is that her attempt has any chance whatsoever. Mm. Statistics mm. Will, will bear evidence to the fact that it's a kind of just an empty word that mm. echoes the walls and then people go on with their life and continue with something else in the absence of strong social institution that kind of shove it down people's throat. Um, I'm not completely sure that, that the pessimist reading is, is completely warranted. But, but I'm not sure that uh, Jane Eisner's vision uh, can materialize, can, can actually lead to a kind of liberal Jewish family that, is, that has a ref replacement rate. I think uh, Danny put it uh, very well. Um, I, I don't think it's a middle ground what he offered. I think really he understood it, the, the stakes which is that um, how do you justify, how do you arrive at that final product that you call the family? So one, which I take to be the Jane Eisner's uh, solution, is in fact the classical liberal solution. You have to start from the individual uh, private wishes. Um, and then there is the other uh, option, which is to say, the needs of the group are prior to those of the individual. Um, and then there, the interesting question, which I think Danny raised and po at least points to, his comment points to that, which is very interesting, is whether those needs of the group are similar when we're talking about the needs of a minority um, w which uh, needs to reproduce itself in um, uh, in conditions of a minority group, and the uh, situation in which uh, we are talking about a state that um, in which the population is fairly homogeneous, in fact, uh, Jewishly homogeneous, and and that I think, and there I think the stakes are quite different, although in both cases the group makes an a priori claim on the individual. <clears throat> We've run late. I thank you for your patience. I want to thank uh, our speakers here, uh, Eva Luz and Danny Lanier-Voss. I'd also like to thank uh, Paul Lerner, who chaired our Niemer Committee, and everyone on the Niemer Committee who put together uh, the work involved in getting our speakers here this evening. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and give you a heads up that we've got another event coming up in February, our Lee Lecture. And then in early March, we have the Warshaw Lecture, which is going to feature Gabby Giffords. And if you're unclear about anything, the easiest thing to do is just Google Kasdan Institute. That will get you to our calendar. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. We hope to see you again in February in March, and again, thanks to our speakers.